Not that I was not hungry, I refused the food. Not that I was not sleepy, I kept awake. My ears keep hearing the cry of an infant. For months in solitary, it was a source of anxiety. For hours to this moment, it is endless excitement. Then came the news of the arrival of my little one. I am the father robbed of my freedom, whose world is shrunk into a dark little dungeon. My child, just born into a world yet unfree. Francis Ku, whose story you'll hear in a moment, was reading that poem by Said Zahari, a Singapore poet who spent the last 15 years in jail. The daughter about whom it's written is now nearly grown up, and it's the sort of poem which inspires other opponents of the present Singapore government. Francis is a lawyer by training, but others have run foul of the government as well. In December 1976, a Singapore journalist filing for his newspaper, the London Financial Times, began his piece with these words. In Southeast Asia, Singapore is the cleanest and greenest city where everything works. There are almost no beggars in the city, no strikes, and unemployment is well within manageable limits. Almost every Singaporean has a roof over his head as a result of a housing program for which the government has footed half the bill. Nothing much to complain of there. Yet he also wrote about the government's intolerance of criticism, control of the press, and student and worker unrest. Six weeks later, the journalist was arrested on charges of alleged pro-communist activities, charges to which he later confessed in a prepared statement broadcast on prime time on government-run television. Many prominent citizens associated with criticism of the government have suffered a similar fate. At present, there are 61 detainees without trial in Singapore, and the total is higher if you include those arrested for preliminary questioning before being detained or released. Three of the detainees have been inside since February 1963. What's extraordinary about the government's intolerance of criticism is that it contrasts with a remarkable economic and political record. On four occasions in the last two decades, and Lee Kuan Yew has been in power for 19 of those years, Singapore's economic collapse has been freely forecast. In fact, Singapore has ridden all the crises. And in the last three elections, Lee Kuan Yew's People's Action Party has won all the seats in Parliament, though the opposition has taken up to a third of the votes cast. So, on the face of it, the government, acknowledged to be the least corrupt in the entire region, perhaps in the whole of Asia, should have little to fear from its critics. Yet it is, at the least, a bossy government. Bossy about things like orderly queuing, careful driving, littering, long hair, and the regulation of marriage, sterilization, and restrictions on union rights. As the jailed journalist wrote, Singapore is a society where people are told what to do. Those who do well are rewarded. But those who ask why are first of all denied the carrot, and then if they persist, given the stick. What worries many people, friends and enemies of Lee Kuan Yew alike, is that his government is resorting with increasing frequency to the stick, and that stick is falling on the backs of people such as Francis Ku, who arrived in England in March last year. My wife and I are in exile today in Britain as political refugees from the government in Singapore. Until the 15th of February last year, 1977, I was a practicing senior member of the legal profession in Singapore. Sui Chai, my wife, was a trainee surgeon attached to the Singapore General Hospital. On that fateful day, life as we had known it came abruptly to a halt. Scores of friends of ours, including lawyers and journalists, were rounded up by the security police. While this was reverberating throughout the island, they came for me at 3.30 a.m. at night. I was asleep in my flat on the 18th floor of a tower block. There was a heavy bang on the door. The doorbell buzzed incessantly. Heavy boots could be heard outside. I didn't reply. They must have assumed that I wasn't in, and they never attempted to break down the door. Eventually, the din stopped, and they settled down to wait for me to return in the morning. All night, I waited and wondered what I should do. They left next morning, presumably to look elsewhere for me and for others on the list. But I was in luck. It was just before the Chinese New Year and the causeway from Singapore to Malaysia was packed with people crossing for their New Year reunions. I headed for the causeway to neighboring Malaysia. There were so many people about that the security checkpoints were unable to cope with the situation. So I was able to make my way to Britain. 
It was a most traumatic experience. But I had no alternative for I did not want to spend years in prison or worse, be forced to make false confessions over television. Neither did I want to implicate my friends or endorse the government and betray the cause of my people. If I had to live in exile for years on end, then I must. Bertel Brecht, the German playwright, once wrote, In the dark times, will there also be singing? Yes, there will be singing about the dark times. I recalled his poem while I was on the plane out of Asia and scribbled this little song on the back of an old envelope. It was the 15th of February, the day of the night, they kept knocking and banging my door. I slipped quietly away, but the others could not, and I know that I'd see them no more. They have taken so many, how many I know not. Well, there's Mahar and Mike and Sami, and there's Jinkui and others, the brave and the tall, and the ones more behind Changi Wall. Oh, my dear bride, my dearest, just two weeks we're wed. Please remember the vow that we made. I have left my homeland for a place far away, but I know I'll be back home someday. Oh, my people, my people, the ones that I love, I will never see you again. Till the storm clouds gather at break of the dawn, and Bunga Raya shall bloom in the rain. When I arrived in Britain, I received news that my wife, Sui Chai, had been arrested while she was at work in the hospital and was subjected to intensive and continuous interrogation. By then, dozens of others were also taken into the same detention camp. As I checked out the list, I realized they were mostly close friends of mine who had attended our wedding dinner party a bare fortnight before. Even the priest who married us was publicly accused of being involved in the formation of a human rights movement. My narrow escape was an acute embarrassment to the security police, and Sui Chai was asked to persuade me to come back quietly. When she was released, she flew to England to meet me. We said, let's have our honeymoon first, and then we'll decide. We did have our honeymoon, and we did decide. We told the British press our story and filed our papers for political asylum. You may well wonder what I had done, that I should have to flee. Although I have never been a member of any political party or have any criminal record, I am wanted by the Internal Security Police of Singapore. For many years, for well over a decade, I have dissented against the direction which the ruling party was pulling our people towards, much against our will. As a law student at university and during my years in law practice, I have been involved in the movement for a more just and equal society. For a few, Singapore is a haven. But for the many, for the bulk of the 2.3 million people, it is a bitter reality of what a society ought not to be. I could not accept this unequal society or the elitist outlook of the government. And so I participated actively in the students' movement in the later half of the 60s. For instance, I opposed the detention without trial of political prisoners and the abolition of the jury system in Singapore. My file with the Internal Security Police grew further by the time I graduated in 1971 and had gone into legal practice. I had been publishing political cartoons for years and I saw no reason why I should stop. And that did not go down well at all with the authorities. My files have all been seized, but I have managed to reconstruct some. Like this one about the limits on having children. And this about the government controlling the length of our hair. In May 1971, the government cracked down on the press. Editors were arrested and newspapers closed, including the Singapore Herald, an English daily with a reputation of taking critical views. The government had accused the papers of sowing discord. They claimed not to mind criticism, but resented the foreign financial subscribers. 
A group of five people, including myself, attempted to revive the Herald as a cooperative paper subscribed and owned entirely by the citizens of Singapore. Despite tremendous public support, we were not allowed the necessary registration. We were blocked, even though Mr. Lee was at that time under heavy fire from the international press. I earned further displeasure for participating in meetings and publication of pamphlets among Christians in Singapore. People in this country may be surprised that this sort of thing should result in the government trying to arrest me. Had I been tried in any courts of justice, there can be no conviction. To begin with, no charges can possibly be preferred. Our prisons have seen hundreds through the years who were arrested in the name of security. The conditions are closely documented by international organizations like Amnesty International. Many have and are spending two, four, ten, even fifteen years behind bars without the prospect of ever coming out unless they publicly renounce their beliefs. People like Dr. Lim Hock Siu, Ho Piao, Dr. Po Sukai, Lee Si Tong and many others endure solitary confinement and uninterrupted interrogation for days on end. And of course, there's Said Zahari, whose poem I read at the beginning of the program. He was arrested in 1963, along with over 120 patriots in the independence movement. Despite our present plight, we are confident of the future. Life, of course, has not at all been easy for us. There is the anguish of being separated from our people and family and friends, and having to build a new life again. I have to retrain for several years before I can get back into legal practice in this country. Yet, I believe that with history as our guide, our people will be free one day. There will be singing and dancing in the streets of Singapore when that day comes, and all the prison gates will be opened and all the exiles will be able to come home. I would now like to end with a song of hope about the Bunga Raya, the hibiscus, our national flower. In a garden, in an island, sprouts a bush among the clay, where the rains have failed to water, and the sun has gone away, all its leaves have turned to amber, while around the land is grey. Yet that bush keeps growing taller, struggling on, it makes its way. Came one dawn, a drop of water fell from heaven's way up high. First one drop, them pitter patter, thunder lightning fills the sky. Tis the dawn, the dawn is breaking, heralding a brave new morn. With the rain, spring little flowers from around the bush upon. So throughout this once dry island sprouts more bushes from the clay. Gardens fill with crimson flowers. Bunga Raya blooms all day. Bunga Raya blooms all day.